Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, the beginning of the end. This is session six of ten, so we're uh, on the downhill slope from this time forward. <clears throat> we economists are, are often accused, uh, correctly, of being Philistines, and uh, so to, uh, to take a little bit of the edge off of that ever-so-valid accusation, I want to begin this session uh, with a poetry reading uh, that is, uh, oddly enough, relevant to this uh, session's topic, uh, the New Deal. This is actually a, a portion of a poem describing, as it were, the New Deal. A dollar for the services a true producer renders, and a dollar for experiments of governmental spenders. A dollar for the earners and the savers and the thrifty, and a dollar for the wasters. It's a case of 50-50. <laughs> We, we owe that uh, to one uh, Burton Braley, who has a whole book full of such <laughs> poems. And uh, that one struck me especially once upon a time. It's uh, one of many indications we have that the New Deal was not as wildly popular as some historians seem to suggest when they tell the story of uh, the Roosevelt administration. And uh, Roosevelt uh, became, uh, during the 30s and 40s, and, and remains to the present time, uh, I'd say, the most popular of all American presidents. Uh, it may be a little neck and neck uh, with Abraham Lincoln, but uh, I, I suspect that... Uh, that uh, if we were to take some kind of a poll, we'd find that uh, Franklin Roosevelt is the most popular American president. And uh, a lot of observations could be made about that curious fact, but uh, the one I want to make right now is that, in, in reality, a lot of people hated him uh, at the time, and, uh, and, it, and it wasn't just... Uh, rich and callous reactionaries. Uh, sometimes when the historians do uh, recognize that people opposed Roosevelt and the New Deal, uh, they, uh, they are quick to represent the opponents as uh, Republican vested interests uh, of, uh, of throwbacks to the age of laissez-faire, uh, which were hard enough to find by 1933, indeed, uh, Republican or otherwise. Uh, but a great many ordinary people uh, uh, hated Roosevelt, or at least disliked him enough to vote against him in elections. So even though he won re-election three times, uh, some of those elections uh, were uh, not wildly lopsided, and uh, even in the ones he he won most easily. Tens of millions of people voted against him. So it wasn't just a few rich capitalists who disliked him and his policies. A lot of people did. But uh, nonetheless, he, he certainly perfected an apparatus for vote buying uh, that succeeded better than, than any uh, other such apparatus ever employed in American national politics, and in the circumstances, it worked like a charm to keep him in office uh, until the Grim Reaper relieved us of the great man. Uh, let, let's uh, take a look at the conditions that allowed uh, Roosevelt to uh, gain office and uh, the New Deal policies to to be uh, implemented. Uh, 
the depression began uh, probably about midway through 1929. If we look at uh, the real economy as opposed to the financial markets, which did, didn't really crash until the stock market crashed in October. But uh, many, many of the uh, time series measuring the level of real economic activity reached their peaks about the middle of 1929. So the economy was already beginning to decline, and then the stock market crash uh, brought everybody's attention to the decline and, and contributed to further decline, along with many other contributors. But the... Uh, uh, real gross national product ultimately fell by approximately 30% between 1929 and 1933 when uh, it hit bottom and uh, then began to bounce back some. Uh, during that slide, uh, real investment spending uh, declined by almost 90%. Uh, and in fact, there was so little investment spending that it was far from uh, enough to make up for uh, the depreciation of existing capital. So in fact, during those years, the capital stock of the country was wasting away because uh, wear and tear was not being compensated. Uh, prices fell a great deal. Uh, for four years straight, and uh, the gross national product deflator, which is a very broad gauge price index, went down by 22 percent. Uh, wholesale prices went down by about 30 percent. Uh, consumer prices uh, uh, a little less. So uh, there was deflation at the same time there was depression, and uh, unfortunately many people have uh, have attributed causal significance to that association ever since and have come to fear deflation as such, uh, although it wasn't the deflation as such that was the problem uh, at the time. It was the depression. Uh, the most important uh, index of the depression uh, for <coughs> most people was the level of unemployment that uh, was reached. Uh, I have here a, a, a graph of the unemployment rate uh, measured as a proportion of the civilian labor force. You can see that prior to 1930, uh, the only time that unemployment rate uh, had, had moved uh, above 10 percent uh, starting from 1890 onward, was during the depression of the mid-1890s, and then it got up into the range of uh, 12 to 14 percent for uh, three or four years in the mid-1890s. Um, uh, but normally, uh, the economy had an unemployment rate that bounced around in the neighborhood of 5 percent. And uh, we, we always expect... Uh, a dynamic economy to have some unemployment because uh, there, there are always adjustments being made in economic life. Some businesses are closing or going broke and their workers have to find uh, new uh, uh, places of employment, which they don't do immediately for perfectly good economic reasons. They sometimes like to spend more time searching for the best opportunity before they accept employment. Uh, so there's a, always a certain amount of so-called frictional unemployment, and uh, it's because some industries may be declining relative to others, uh, even in declining in absolute terms, uh, there's a, a shedding of labor that uh, then has to relocate to other employment opportunities. So structural changes that were going on in a growing economy also contributed to some unemployment. So... 5% is approximately what we would view as about a normal level of unemployment uh, in, in uh, this uh, economy. But uh, we see now that uh, very quickly in the early 1930s, the unemployment rose to, to heights never reached before, uh, not even uh, approached before. Uh, and even though uh, after 1933 the unemployment rate did fall a great deal, uh, 
uh, for several years uh, till 1937. Even in 1937, it's barely dipped below 10%. That is, in, in what seemed to be a prosperous year, in fact, many people in 1937 were talking as, as if, well, the Depression is about over. You know, we're, we've been growing rapidly for four years now, and unemployment has fallen, and real production has risen, and we're just about out of this. Uh, but still, unemployment was uh, was almost 10%, and then it popped back up again in the so-called depression within a depression that began in 1937 and, and on an annual basis was worse in 1938. And that wiped out much of the progress that people thought had occurred. Uh, it was a very deep depression by most standard measures. The investment spending almost collapsed completely for a year or a year and a half. And uh, the stock market fell drastically. And uh, it, it, was, it was a very big depression. If it weren't embedded in this gigantic long Great Depression, it would be viewed as the, the third worst <laughs> uh, business slump in our history, uh, but most people don't even know it happened uh, because uh, I guess it's a little like uh, getting pneumonia when you're when you're fighting leukemia or something. <laughs> You've got bigger troubles going on, and and who's going to pay a lot of attention to this other one? Uh, but uh, finally, in the early 1940s, we see the unemployment rate drop and fall to. Uh, almost disappear during the war, and uh, that, of course, people misinterpreted, too, uh, by presuming that the government's spending for war purposes had, in a Keynesian-type fashion, been responsible for economic recovery, and that uh, this was a, a, a bona fide recovery, uh, like the ones that take place in civilian circumstances, but it, it, it was very different. Uh, because uh, of the war conditions, and I'll talk about them in a later talk. But uh, the point of this graph that's, cl I hope, clear enough is that, that th this was an extraordinary time, and it lasted a long time. I mean, we look at this, uh, and there, there's a whole century of experience displayed there, so it doesn't look very long, uh, but if, say, you were a young person that, that, that grew up and started looking for work in the early 1930s, it must have seemed like forever that and it was hard to find a decent job. Uh, in fact, a lot of young people never had a proper job for the whole decade because there were so many workers looking for jobs that employers had their pick. They could be very choosy. And there were all kinds of anecdotes that went around about, say, a gas station needs somebody to pump gas. So it puts up a sign, help wanted, and a hundred guys show up standing in line to uh, interview for the job, and the gas station owner comes out and says, all right, everybody who's not a college graduate, drop out of the line. <laughs> you know, as if that were necessary uh, to do the job, but... He could set all kinds of extraordinary conditions and still hire somebody. Uh, amazing things happen. Uh, thousands of American engineers, uh, unable to find employment in engineering, went to the Soviet Union to work in, so in Stalin's industrialization program, building factories in Russia. <laughs> amazing. Uh, and some, some uh, lines of work in some industries, some places, it wasn't 15 or 20 or 25 percent unemployment. It was 50 or 75 percent unemployment, depending on uh, the specialty. Uh, while real production fell by 30 percent, construction fell by almost 80 percent. So that if you were a worker with a construction skill, whether it's architect, engineer, or carpenter, plumber, whatever, uh, unemployment rates were extraordinary. There just w was hardly any construction going on in the early 1930s. Uh, 
Uh, so you had to look for some other kind of work or, or, or move to some uh, unusual place. And, uh, and all, people resorted to all of these measures to try to cope. They did the various inventive and desperate things. Uh, my family had a whole collection of family lore about how my father managed to survive during the 1930s. And uh, for a while, he, uh, he chopped wood. And uh, he would chop a cord of wood. And if you know how much that is, it's, it's quite a large stack of, uh, of chopped wood uh, <laughs> for a dollar. Uh, he'd get paid for chopping a cord of wood. Uh, on one occasion, uh, he and my mother and my older brother, I wasn't born then, but uh, they moved to Arizona and lived in a tent and picked cotton uh, somewhere in the outskirts of Phoenix uh, because they wanted cotton pickers out there. And that was something they knew about and went out to find work. So uh, pe- people did extraordinary things. Uh, and, of course, many people who weren't as, uh, as willing or as able uh, to, to do extraordinary things were happy to go on the government dole when government doles came along and were made available to them. Uh, th- th- those were still times when uh, many Americans thought that was wrong to go on the dole, period. Uh, my family was like that. Uh, that was just a shameful thing. So they didn't. But uh, even people who had felt that way before, after years and years and years of hardship, began to say, well, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll go on the government dole. I don't see very many good alternatives. So uh, these conditions were calculated, as it were, to grind down people's moral sensibilities, to make them more desperate and more willing to turn to uh, government measures that they otherwise would have objected to, if not on practical or political grounds, on moral grounds, in many cases. uh, this decade had a, a profound ex- effect on the character of the American people, for the worse, much for the worse. Okay. Well, after this initial slide went on for four years running and things reached such abysmal depths, a great many people had grown quite desperate for some way to stop it and improve the situation. And to understand the New Deal, we really have to understand that sense of desperation that existed by the time Franklin Roosevelt took office. Because it was that atmosphere in which all of these New Deal proposals were put forward and uh, enacted into law and put into practice. Uh, These things were not thrust upon people. And in fact, one of the remarkable attributes of those conditions in 1933 was that uh, the scope of the, the interest groups and types of people clamoring for government aid was very, very wide. It wasn't, for example, like the Depression of the 90s when unemployed people and farmers uh, tried to press for government assistance especially. Now we've got everybody from rich capitalists down (laughs) through middle-class homeowners and uh, farmers who own land down to unemployed people at the other end of the scale. Everybody is now clamoring for some kind of aid from the only place they see as capable of providing it, government. Many of them had become convinced by 1933 that the market system just had broken down. They looked around and said, it doesn't work anymore. Don't tell me any old Adam Smith stuff. Look around you. The machine is busted. The only way out is through government assistance. Yes, yes, I know, that's not the American way. But 
This is a different situation. So they said, okay, what can government do for us? What kind of help can it provide? Okay. Now, when, the, when we think about the New Deal, it's, it, 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 it's hard to hold it in our hand uh, it, it, without it slipping away because it's not a coherent thing. It's not a program or a plan that all hangs together logically. <laughs> Uh, in fact, very often it seems to be a, a whole collection of programs that war with one another because one kind of New Deal program has an effect on variable X to move it upward at the same time that another New Deal program has an effect on variable X to move it downward. So it, it, it looks as if this is just a hodgepodge of things that don't make any any sense, and I, th I think we need to recognize that ideologically it doesn't make any sense. That it's, uh, it's a mass of expedience. Uh, the, the only common denominator here is it's all something being done by government, and in many cases, not all, but many, federal government. Uh, many of them things that had never been done before, at least at the federal level of government, if at any level. Okay. So, we get every kind of political view coming into play here, with, with the possible exception of classical liberalism, I suppose. <laughs> they didn't have a lot of input into the New Deal. Uh, but classical liberals were hard to find in 1933. And e even people that you might think as not just classical liberal, but paragons of classical liberalism, uh, people like some of the professors at uh, the University of Chicago, you know, Frank Knight, uh, uh, Simons, uh, Viner. You go back and uh, you, you look at some of the measures that were being proposed and tried in 1933, and you'll find these guys signing their names to support them. Uh, so classical liberalism really didn't have many people manning the barricades uh, at the time. Some of them came back to life later on <laughs> and regretted, I think, their having lost the faith uh, in, in the pit of the Depression. But we have people of all, all sorts of uh, views and schemes uh, if you just look at uh, Roosevelt's brain trusters, for example, you've, you, you've got on the one hand uh, Rexford Tugwell, who's a, I don't know, he's a near communist, I guess you could say. He certainly believed in socialism. He was one of the many naive Americans who, who had taken the ritual journey to the Soviet Union and had come back quite enthusiastic about what he had seen. <laughs> Of course, we all know how they were toured around and uh, kept out of sight of, uh, of the reality. But at all events, uh, he, he believed in planning and nationalization of industry, of central uh, direction by the government. Uh, he wanted to, the government to even take over land ownership uh, so that uh, <laughs> would have central planning of agriculture. That's enough to give a Misesian a real headache, you know. Uh, but uh, there's Tugwell on the one hand, uh, and then there's Hugh Johnson, uh, who's a, a cartelizer, a big business flack. Uh, on the other, uh, he certainly doesn't want to eliminate uh, private property uh, in the formal sense, at least, uh, although he certainly wants... Uh, wants a little fascistic organization for the assistance of his government uh, keepers. Uh, there, uh, there's uh, Moley, Raymond Moley. Uh, Moley doesn't know anything. I mean, he's specialized in criminology, but, uh, but he's kind of a middle-of-the-road new dealer who, who, who's willing to try anything, but not anything real radical. So these guys are all over the place. And, and, and if you look beyond the brain trust to... to all the people who are involved in making proposals or implementing proposals, they, they range from, from people who are, 
who have monetary crank schemes like George Warren, the Cornell professor who thought if we raised the price of gold, we'd raise the price of everything. Uh, if so facto, just like that. Uh, his, his statistical work had proven it. <laughs> uh, to to uh, leftover populists who wanted the government to, to print paper money and give it to farmers, uh, to, uh, to big businessmen like Gerard Swope, the head of General Electric Corporation, who wanted to, to cartelize all of industry and let businessmen run the cartels, uh, to, to do-gooders who wanted the government to come on board and, and uh, set minimally decent conditions for women and children working in industry. Uh, and it just goes on and on. Labor unionists, uh, they're all part of the New Deal. And they obviously are, are very strange bed, bedfellows, ideologically or practically. Uh, but they're all in there. And so we, we need to bear that in mind. Uh, otherwise, we'll never understand how this thing came into being or how it worked. Uh, the, the, the second thing I think uh, that is helpful is to recognize the extent to which New Deal programs just uh, brought back to life uh, the programs that had been used uh, during World War I by the Wilson administration. Now, in some ways, you can see immediately that, that, that that's what you would expect because Look, after Wilson left office, the Republicans have had <laughs> control of the bureaucracy and sometimes the Congress, too, uh, uh, until the New Deal starts. So now all of these Democrats who've been living in the wilderness for 12 years are suddenly back, you know, they, they've left their haunts. Nowadays, you know, when this happens, guys bail out of the Brookings Institution and go back into the federal bureaucracy. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> Brookings had just got started back in those days, so it couldn't warehouse as many Democrats out of office, but they, they, they found places out there and waited their turn, and now their turn has come again, and they come back wanting to do the same kinds of things they used to do. So it's natural that they would want to reinvent the, the War Finance Corporation and reinvent the Food Administration and reinvent the, the uh, War Industries Board and all the rest of it. Uh, but the other, the other thing that, that is important and, is, uh, and affected far more people is, is that many people had come away from World War I with the idea, which I suggested this morning was planted there by Bernard Baruch and his friends, uh, that World War I had been an example of very successful government economic management. So they, they, they readily swallowed a kind of analogy, uh, which was that World War I was a great national emergency, and we dealt with it with programs of this sort. We're now in a terrible economic depression, which is a national emergency. So we know how to deal with national emergencies. We've dealt with them before. Let's do it the same way we did last time. Of course, the analogy was totally far-fetched. The, 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 the sense in which World War I had constituted a national emergency was totally different from the sense in which the Great Depression constituted a national emergency. So it was a very faulty uh, uh, logic, uh, but nonetheless, it was one that had a kind of uh, gut-level appeal. Uh, and when people thought about uh, proposals, they, they were sometimes easily led to accept those proposals on grounds no stronger than that. The, the, the third element that many of these uh, proposals and programs shared was that they sought uh, to raise prices. Uh, as I said, there had been a lot of deflation, somewhere, uh, depending on the price you looked at, between 20 and 30 percent, or, or even more. Farm prices fell by more than 50 percent on average. So, People looked around, and of course, if you were selling good or service X, <laughs> and its price had fallen, you, you thought to yourself, I'd be a lot better off if I could get a higher price for what I sell. The problem is prices are too low. Well, yeah, for every individual, that could be viewed as a problem. But of course, uh, it's completely different if all prices have fallen, 
Uh, and your problem won't necessarily be solved, of course, if all prices are raised. But people viewed this matter piecemeal. Farmers said, we need to get farm prices up. Of course, if prices they paid for labor and materials and equipment and everything else went up accordingly, they wouldn't be any better off. Uh, but they didn't think of it that way. Uh, what we're doing is trying to raise farm prices. Manufacturers were trying to raise the price of cars or refrigerators or whatever they had to sell. And so people looked at this as a question of price raising. The term was reflation at the time. They were seeking reflation. And, uh, and many of the New Deal programs aimed uh, to, to achieve reflation, in, in many cases, bizarrely, by supply restrictions. <laughs> and again, if you think in terms of partial analysis, the, uh, if you think in terms of one industry at a time or one commodity at a time, well, yes, restricting supply, other things being equal, will cause a higher price to prevail in the market. But if we have an anti-depression policy that consists of restricting supply across the board, <laughs> that's, that's simply ensuring that the whole economy's real output falls even farther. That's what the depression really consists of is low levels of producing real goods and services. So this was a, 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 a kind of policy guaranteed to fail when implemented on a wide scale. But that's how it was implemented. And particularly when it worked through the War Industries Board, which affected most of uh, the manufacturing sector of the economy, uh, it it was responsible for drastically slowing the economy's recovery uh, after 1933. We've seen it did recover some, but without the National Recovery Administration, it would have recovered much quicker. Uh, but people were trying to raise prices. Uh, one other attribute that we see of the events of that period is that uh, they gave rise to a great deal of centralization of government activity. Uh, functions that had been performed before at some level of government, such as relief of the unemployed and the destitute, that had been overwhelmingly done by local governments in this country for centuries. Towns, counties, made efforts to relieve uh, people who were impoverished. Every county had what used to be known as the poor house, <laughs> where you could house people who were destitute. Uh, cities during business slumps would set up soup lines, where at least you could go get something to eat uh, at the expense of the city uh, if you were out of work and, and didn't have any, uh, any food. Uh, but during uh, the New Deal, uh, welfare and relief <coughs> Uh, came to be much more centralized uh, at the federal level. Federal government had never undertaken to provide those kinds of benefits to people before at all. It hadn't even been willing to subsidize states and local governments doing so. Uh, but beginning in 1932, uh, when Hoover was still in office, the federal government did begin to make loans, uh, it turned out they were actually gifts because subsequently the loans were for, forgiven, loans to states so that the states would have the funds to uh, pay for uh, more provision of relief to unemployed and destitute people. Uh, so in many, many ways, uh, uh, the government be became more centralized as a result of the way the New Deal policies were constructed. Uh, I'll, I'll come back in a minute to this final aspect having to do with the distinction between the early and the later New Deal. Now, there's so many things that happened, I, I, I can barely even list them, much less say anything intelligent about them in, in a few minutes here. But I just want to touch on some of the, the high points and uh, and make a few comments that I hope are, are worthwhile. As I said, the farmers were suffering disproportionately. 
And in fact, uh, in some places, so much so that, the, that they were becoming violent. Uh, farmers were having their farms repossessed when they were unable to make payments on their mortgages. So the, the mortgage holders, uh, <laughs> as the lending agreements provided for, were, were taking the security <laughs> uh, when, when they weren't uh, receiving the interest that was due. Well, uh, okay, you might say the farmers had agreed to this. This was a term of the contract they'd entered into. Uh, but uh, that's a hard thing to stomach, particularly if this is a farm uh, that uh, you've lived on your whole life. Uh, maybe your parents lived there. Uh, maybe you were born there. This is not just a farm. It's not just a piece of security for a loan. Uh, it's, on the one hand, your livelihood. Uh, and on the other, maybe it's a lot, a lot more than that. So a lot of these farmers took offense to having insurance companies or bankers come around with the sheriff and tell them, you've got to get out of here. This is not your land anymore. It's not your farmhouse. Uh, and uh, particularly out in the Midwest, some of them became violent. And they, uh, when the sheriff came around or when the bankers came around to tell, tell them they were going to be uh, put off of their property, they, they, they threatened uh, to shoot these people. Uh, and in some cases, they, they resorted to, to going after them, beating them up or uh, menacing them in some way. And, uh, and of course, the authorities weren't going to tolerate that, but in some cases, they did tolerate it because they didn't want to start killing local citizens uh, in, in these circumstances. Uh, and eventually, 25 states uh, in the years 1932-34 uh, passed uh, stay laws on uh, mortgage obligations, and that allowed people who were who were in a position to be foreclosed on uh, to have more time to repay, and in some cases actually change the terms of what they owed. Uh, this was uh, this was a classic case of what you might call interference with the obligation of contract, <laughs> to use the words of the United States Constitution. And in fact, it was. It was precisely this sort of thing. Actually, th this event applicable to, to, to farm mortgages that had caused the trouble that led the framers of the Constitution to put that language in there to begin with. Because it was not the first time that this situation had arisen and the debtors had prevailed on state governments to help them out, to give them more time or to scale down what they owed. Uh, and had brought forth some plausible argument. They came forward and they said, look, uh, I, I borrowed this money, sure enough, but when I borrowed it, you know, the money was worth a lot less than it is now. So these banks are asking me to repay $100. That's a lot more real purchasing power than I borrowed from them uh, or that I promised to repay. So, so that's not right. <laughs> And it's, uh, it's often in these changes, in these situations where the price level has fluctuated violently that we see these kinds of conflicts between borrowers and lenders because that's precisely what gets deranged. These contracts that have a, 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 an intertemporal dimension. They're all premised on somebody's forecast of what the pr price level will be in the future when certain money obligations are, are due. And, and if people misforecast and make mistakes, they get themselves in deep economic trouble. And that's what the farmers had done, who, who tended to be debtors, uh, and found themselves with real repayment obligations much greater than they had expected they would have. E even without that, they would have been having enough trouble. <laughs> they, things were difficult as it was, but that made the, their situation much worse. So these states did pass the mortgage moratoria, and they were challenged on constitutional grounds and, and, and taken to the U.S. Supreme Court, which actually ruled uh, that, uh, that the states could do that. that uh, the, it was one of those less than crystal clear decisions, but uh, the upshot of it was that the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court did not strike down 
uh, the Minnesota moratorium law, which was the one under challenge, and, and therefore all the others that were like it at the time. Uh, businessmen uh, were losing money hand over fist in most cases. In, in 1931, 32, 33, net corporate profits were negative every year. <laughs> Didn't mean every single business in America lost money, of course, but it meant that <laughs> If you take all the losses, uh, they're, they're bigger than all the gains. So uh, there's never been anything like that before. There's never been a time when uh, net earnings of business were negative three years running. So businessmen, everybody from General Electric and General Motors down to mom and pop, uh, were very apprehensive uh, about their ability to remain in business and, of course, the failure rate of businesses skyrocketed in those years, and many people did, in fact, go broke and, and lose their investments. Uh, so businessmen were, in all sorts of ways, clamoring for some kind of bailout. And uh, eventually, uh, that pressure coalesced, uh, in large part, uh, in support of the the National Industrial Recovery Act, passed in the spring of 1933, uh, administered by the National Recovery Administration, NRA, uh, which authorized businessmen to get together and form so-called codes of fair competition. Right? Now, if, if you apply Higgs' rule of political rhetoric to this term, uh, by simply reversing it in order to find its actual meaning, uh, what you find, of course, is that these were all intended to suppress competition. And they did, they did that in uh, endless variety of ways. Uh, each industry had a different kind of uh, regulations it concocted. And uh, even though supposedly uh, workers and the public were involved along with businessmen in writing these codes, they, they were written almost exclusively by, by the bigger business owners in each industry. Uh, eventually, some 750 of them were written and approved by the government. Uh, and, and it didn't do any good to have principles, because if you didn't get together in your industry and write one, the government would impose one on you. Uh, so the New Deal lawyers would sit down, and uh, if you and the nuts and nuts and bolts industry hadn't produced a code of fair competition, they would write one and and impose it on you that was legally binding. So of course, all businessmen decided it's better better to try to design this thing ourselves than to have these these uh, young Harvard grads in Washington D.C. do it uh, and force it on us. <coughs> So, so that's what people did, and, and they, in some cases, suppressed competition by uh, imposing standardization on products, because, of course, one of the ways that, that people compete is by differentiating their products. Eh? My product's designed differently or performs differently from yours. It's better. Well, I, I may out-compete your product. If we're going to cut competition, we've got to get rid of it. Uh, uh, of that kind of behavior. A lot of reporting requirements went in so that uh, the uh, making of better deals uh, that is, again, one of the standard ways that businessmen compete. You know, I give you better financing terms or I give you quicker delivery or I give you more uh, additional services or maintenance or whatever it is that I, I have as part of our agreement. Uh, if my competitors don't know how I'm sweetening the deal, then they can't so readily meet my terms and, and get those customers back from me or prevent them from ever switching to begin with. So the, many of these codes required businessmen to report all kinds of details about the business they were doing and thereby reveal, make public to everybody in the industry uh, what the transactions were and prevent uh, sweet deals from being made without the knowledge of uh, other members of the industry. Uh, and, and it just went on and on and on. In some cases, they put restrictions on, on uh, how much time plants could be operated uh, so that, you know, if, if my business happens to be so good that I'm just running uh, 
uh, two shifts a day, well, maybe if I were restricted and could only run one shift a day, then I wouldn't be able to serve as many customers and some of them would end up at your place instead. Uh, there's no end to the number of ways that have kind of a, kind of a plausible rationale about them, and yet if you approach them by asking, what is the effect of this provision on competition? You find in every instance the effect is to diminish the vitality of competition. Uh, and, and so we got all of these co codes that you can think of as cartel agreements, uh, not necessarily classic type cartel agreements of dividing a market by area or fixing a price, but uh, but serving the same purpose. Uh, that, <clears throat> that, that was similar to what the fascists had done in Italy under Mussolini. Uh, and at the time, uh, Mussolini's uh, economic policies had many uh, uh, adherents in the United States. And if, if you go back and read the uh, periodicals of the early 30s, you may be astonished to find uh, businessmen and journalists and politicians all writing so favorably about Mussolini and the great job he was doing with uh, the Italian economy uh, and, and suggesting that that's what we need uh, in more ways than one. We not only need to organize industry the way Mussolini has done in Italy by you know, getting labor and <coughs> government and business together and that kind of cooperation. That cooperation sounds like a good idea, right? Of course, if they had looked into how the Italian system worked, they would have found that the cooperation was all people doing what the government told them to do, <laughs> that these, these fascist organizations were all frauds, uh, and in fact, the government dictated the rules from top to bottom. But nonetheless, uh, uh, many people at the time thought not only that business government a cooperation sounded like a good idea. I mean, diminish conflict, right? Have a more harmonious world. But they also liked the idea of having a dictator. It, it may be the only time in American history where people openly espoused uh, dictatorship. They, they looked around and they said, look, our politicians just do nothing. Here we are, we're floundering in this terrible situation. They can't seem to act. Uh, we're, we've got too much gridlock. Uh, we need a dictator, somebody who can really take charge and get something done, uh, like Mussolini. Uh, so, so this was the climate uh, of the early 30s that gave rise to the NIRA. Now, of course, no sooner had they created these monstrosities than many people discovered that uh, th they didn't deliver what they had expected them to deliver. The benefits were not forthcoming. Uh, labor unions had signed up for the NIRA because it, it had provisions that required every code to provide uh, for collective bargaining. And that's what they'd been trying to get the government to support for a long, long time. So, great, this is wonderful. Uh, we'll be able to organize like gangbusters now because people will have to recognize uh, our, our unions and bargain collectively with us. Uh, but uh, it didn't work out very well. And in a lot of cases, uh, businessmen still wouldn't recognize and bargain with unionists when they came forward. And uh, in addition, uh, it was clear that the whole setup was being created and administered by business people. And the unionists were just tokens in this apparatus, and no one was paying much real attention to them. Uh, even the businessmen, once they got their code authorities in operation, began to resent them uh, because uh, the government, uh, which they thought was just going to endow them with this wonderful uh, authority and, and then step aside and let them wield it as they thought best, didn't step aside. Bureaucrats kept showing up over and over, wanting to see reports, wanting to talk to them about this and that, wanting to see what they were doing. And, and this kind of uh, chronic meddling by government officials was new to them. They'd never had to tolerate that before except briefly during World War I. Uh, so the, they began to think, well, that isn't what we were trying to do. <laughs> uh, this isn't working out. 
and, and furthermore, many of them discovered that, that the very purpose of these schemes, the reflation, wasn't working out either. If you go back and look at what happened to prices after 1933, there's a little bounce up in 1934, maybe 6 or 7% increase in prices, and that's it. Price indexes hardly budge for the rest of the decade. <laughs> so these people who had just had their prices fall by 20, 30, 40%, depending on the industry, uh, wanting to go back to where they were, and they're not even getting close to prices they used to charge for their goods. So they're saying, this isn't uh, delivering the goods. This is not what we thought we'd accomplish, and yet we have to put up with all this meddling by government officials and lawyers and people asking us to send in reports every week or every month. So a lot of people became badly disillusioned by the uh, National Recovery Scheme. Uh, it had provisions in there besides authorizing uh, labor unionization, uh, provisions for, for minimum wages and for uh, setting uh, working conditions at, at, at decent uh, levels. And uh, that turned out to have considerable effect, particularly in some industries and places. If you, uh, if you were to look, for example, at, at wages, uh, well, let's do that the other way around. Let's take the wage level out here, and look at the frequency with which that wage rate is paid up here. You find a distribution of, of wages in, 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 in any industry, and let's say we look at people who work in the lumber industry in the south. That was a big southern industry in, in, in those days, and, and we'd find a distribution that looks like that. And most of the workers have relatively low wages, and then as we go out, we find a few have higher wage levels. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that is the general shape of the wage distribution for almost any kind of work we can think of. Well, what happened was that when they put these uh, NIRA minimum wages into effect, uh, they, they were set at levels like uh, 25 cents an hour. Okay. Well, if we take a southern... Uh, Lumber workers, we'd find that 25 cents is right here. So uh, any wage lower than that can no longer be legally paid under this scheme. Well, here are all these workers who used to work at some wage less than 25 cents an hour, and employers now simply discover that they're not worth hiring anymore. <laughs> so they lay them off. They fire them. And uh, a great many southern workers and workers in other low-wage regions and low-wage industries and occupations found themselves suddenly out of work because of the uh, NIRA minimum wage. And uh, for that reason, the NRA... Came to be known among many blacks as the Negro Removal Administration. <laughs> and, and correctly known for that, because blacks tended to work in uh, relatively low wage occupations and low wage industries, and so they were disproportionately affected by that, by that provision. Uh, at the same time, in agriculture, uh, provisions for administering the agricultural benefits were structured in such a way that, that landowners received payments, even when landowners operated their farms with tenant labor. Okay. So the, the landowners uh, got rid of anybody who might have a competing claim to receive a farm benefits from the federal government, and the result was that a lot, a lot of uh, tenants were dismissed and replaced by wage workers, and then the farm owner raked in the, the benefits that were coming from uh, the federal government. 
So once again, the effect of that in the South was that a lot of uh, black farm tenants found themselves dismissed or asked to change their status and become wage workers, uh, and uh, many of them were just let go. In addition, uh, many of the farmers were able to use their agricultural benefits to buy machinery and then replace labor with machinery so that uh, they didn't need as much labor as before. They operated with more capital and less labor, and that, again, set blacks on the road. Uh, it, blacks had always been avid supporters of the Republican Party, all the way from emancipation to 1932. But uh, they, they began to switch, strangely enough, and there's an irony here, because from what I've been telling, you'd think they'd see that, that the government was the cause of, of their immediate woes, uh, at least uh, in, in part. Uh, but in fact, what was happening at the same time is that the federal government was establishing work relief and, and dole programs for which blacks were eligible. And so being put in this dire circumstance by the federal government and then turning around and getting some pittance of relief from the WPA or from some other federal uh, dole agency, uh, they concluded that the federal government had saved them. So uh, from that time forward, blacks in this country became strong supporters of the Democratic Party and uh, uh, until in the last 50 years. It's more like a 90% level of support uh, for Democrats uh, among the black population. Uh, and that all happened by virtue uh, of the New Deal programs. Okay. Uh, a, a great many programs had something to do with finance. The uh, laws were changed, uh, first of all, to go off the gold standard. Uh, Roosevelt did that by executive order. The second day he was in office, uh, he declared a, a, uh, a bank holiday, nationwide bank holiday. Uh, by that time, the states themselves had closed most of the banks in the country, uh, which meant you, banks just weren't allowed to do any business. You, you couldn't go withdraw money or, or get a check cleared or anything. Uh, they were just shut down, uh, and they were shut down totally for a week, uh, after which uh, the banks began to reopen with federal approval after federal banking inspectors had gone around and looked at their books and declared some of them safe enough to reopen. But it took many, many months uh, for uh, all of them to, well, most of them to come back into operation. Some of them were never reopened. They were simply closed permanently uh, because the inspectors declared them unfit uh, to be operated uh, again at all. Uh, and when Roosevelt declared the bank holiday, he also put restrictions on uh, uh, dealings in, international dealings in gold. And uh, quickly thereafter, he nationalized the gold uh, and uh, required everybody to surrender their gold uh, except those people who used gold for industrial uh, purposes or, or jewelry or, or for collector's items. Uh, but if you had either gold coins, uh, which were still circulating quite widely in those days, or gold certificates, uh, paper money, which uh, was uh, directly redeemable for a fixed amount of gold, you had to surrender all of those forms of money uh, to the Federal Reserve System and you, you would be given, what? <laughs> Federal Reserve notes, what else? Uh, so what did the Federal Reserve note promise to pay you? Lawful money, still does. What's that? More Federal Reserve notes. <laughs> so that's where he made that switch uh, in 1933. And having gone off gold, uh, the New Dealers uh, then undertook to pursue George Warren's uh, cockamamie scheme which is to try to get reflation by raising the price of gold. Uh, the na the uh, government began uh, to use the Reconstruction Finance Corporation uh, to uh, bid up the price, the dollar price of gold, uh, starting in the spring of 1933, and it edged it up a little bit every week, every week, uh, the in, uh, 
the Reconstruction Finance guys would come in and talk to Roosevelt. Well, what do you want the price of gold to be this week? <laughs> you can't imagine anything more arbitrary than that. The President of the United States saying now what the price of gold should be this week, and gradually he set it higher and higher and higher. And uh, under the law that Congress had passed in the spring of 1933, he was he was allowed to to raise the price uh, uh, by 60 percent. So when he finally got uh, got the price up to $35, that was a 59 percent increase in the dollar price of gold, which in the old days had been $20.67. He said, "Okay, that's it. That's where we stop." And the government did, in fact, hold the price of gold at $35 an ounce from 1934 until the early 1970s, when it finally gave up uh, fixing the dollar price of gold. Yes, sir. I think something. Well, I thought it was illegal to own gold with the Roosevelt administration. Only monetary gold. Do you purchase gold bullion? No, you could purchase gold for use in industry, or in, uh, you could maintain jo gold jewelry, uh, or you could have collector's pieces. So you could buy gold for $35 an ounce to yes. make into jewelry? Yes, that's right, yeah. So it, wa it wasn't a forbidden substance. But uh, monetary gold was forbidden, not only the use of monetary gold, but even the possession of monetary gold. So if you had a big uh, collection of uh, you know, gold eagles that you'd <laughs> put in your piggy bank over the years, uh, that, w that was unlawful to hold on to you know, 50 of those, say. Uh, you, they, they'd probably let you keep a few in a collection. Uh, I don't know what the exact limit would have been. I do know they, they allowed some collector's items to be retained. They started letting people have gold again in 73. Uh, uh, I think it was 73 when the government changed the law and allowed uh, people to deal in gold, possess gold, monetary gold, any amount. And back then, uh, people started buying Krugerrands and you know, foreign gold pieces that were still in existence, mostly South African gold coins. Uh, I, uh, I had a friend who... He tried to get me involved in speculating on gold in the early 70s, and uh, I said, nah, I don't know anything. Uh, I'd lose my shirt. And of course, uh, if I'd done it, I would have got rich within a few years. But, well, there's just another one of those times I didn't get rich. Okay. <laughs> but uh, in addition to going off gold, again, this is part of the refl reflation program, okay? Well, we already know it didn't work. They, they raised the price of gold 59%, but prices in general only came up about 6 or 7% for the rest of the decade. So George Warren was decisively refuted and had to go back to Cornell and, and wallow in his price data some more. But, uh, uh, but they didn't give up on reflation. Okay. And uh, in 1935, the banking laws were amended uh, significantly so that authority was centralized in Washington, D.C., in the, in the Federal Reserve Board, whereas before, the individual banks had had much more autonomy in setting their policies, and the New York City uh, Fed had been the leader and, and most important, but still only one of 12. Uh, there really was no... Uh, formally centralized monetary policy making prior to 1935, except to the extent that uh, Benjamin Strong at the New York Fed or somebody else could persuade uh, the other banks to act uh, in, in a coordinated way. And sometimes they did, uh, uh, or sometimes the New York Bank was so decisive that it could really affect the course of events by its own actions. But only after 1935 did we have something that qualifies as a, as a central bank equivalent to those of, say, the Western European countries. Uh, that, that didn't do any good either. <laughs> Obviously, nothing the Fed did in the whole decade of the Great Depression can be said to have helped in any way. And uh, the monetarists, of course, blamed the entire debacle on the Federal Reserve System because uh, they uh, 
say it simply stood by and did not act decisively enough to prevent that 30% reduction in money stock between 1929 and 1933. It did not intervene actively enough to prevent that series of banking panics, which gave rise to ultimately more than 9,000 bankruptcies of commercial banks, and therefore it's to blame. It created such a terrible situation that it took the rest of the decade to get out of it. Well, that's an argument, but I I think that's far from a complete story uh, of, of why the Depression was as deep as it was Uh, and uh, how it might have been prevented or how recovery might have been brought about more quickly. Uh, Neoclassical economists have come, even the people who are semi-Keynesian, have come to be very naive monitors about the whole experience of the Great Depression. They just think everything turned on one variable. It was all a matter of what the money stock was in the United States. And I think that's a badly mistaken interpretation uh, for example, suppose the Fed had been more active after 1933 and, and, and instead of being quiescent and letting gold inflows gradually cause the money stock to, to increase. Uh, suppose they had just did everything they could and made the, made the uh, money stock grow by 25% a year. Uh, could they have then brought about uh, full recovery by 1938? Uh, I would claim that they could not have if other things had happened in the same way. If, for example, the New Deal had adopted the same policies, no amount of money creation would have led businessmen and investors to resume the investment at all levels when they were afraid that they were going to be wiped out and or, or even have their property confiscated by the federal government. We've seen any number of countries in the world have rapid rates of money growth, and they don't have prosperity. All they have is inflation. And I think uh, the neoclassical economists have simply overlooked the context of the 1930s and and, uh, put way too much emphasis on both the initial collapse of money. I think it did contribute to the financial debacle of those years, uh, and, and much too much emphasis on uh, the ability of monetary acceleration to have brought the economy out of the conditions prevailing in 1933. But uh, needless to say, that's an endlessly debated topic in, uh, in macroeconomics, uh, even, even now, after all this time. Let me say just a little bit about uh, the labor reforms. Uh, the... NIRA was declared unconstitutional in 1935 on the grounds that uh, Congress had delegated unconstitutional authority to the president uh, by just letting him uh, approve or even create these codes of fair competition. Uh, And uh, so that came to an end. And I don't think it... Too many people were sorry to see it go, uh, although I've run into a few other historians who think they have a lot of evidence that some businessmen continued. Butler Schaefer, for example, in his book argues that, in fact, a lot of business people would like to have had NIRA continue or be recreated in some constitutionally acceptable way, but uh, my reading is uh, the same as I think most historians, which is that people had had enough of NIRA by 1935. Uh, Even the people who had liked it to begin with had stopped liking it in most cases. But, uh, But what happened is as soon as it was declared unconstitutional is that some of the parts that had a lot of political support were reenacted in other ways. uh, the most important of those reenactments was the labor provisions. The old Section 7A that authorized collective bargaining was blown up hugely into the, the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, often called the Wagner Act. Uh, and from that time on, that law is still in effect as, am, as amended, 1935, uh, uh, The right to bargain collectively was guaranteed by the federal government, and and a whole list of so-called unfair labor practices identified uh, 
which meant that it was unlawful for employers to take various actions uh, they had routinely taken in the past to discourage the formation or operation of unions in their workplaces. So it, it, after 1935, for example, uh, an, an employer could not even uh, circulate information to workers. Let's say a union came and tried to organize his workforce. Uh, he might have in the past circulated a flyer saying, look, if you uh, adopt a union here, the consequences are going to be the following. Uh, I'm going to lay off 10% of you or... <laughs> Uh, I'm going to change the way I, I forgive you for coming in late or, you know, any number of things could have been uh, uh, told to the workers, but that kind of information was outlawed. Uh, company unions were outlawed. Of course, the, the unionists had always hated company unions because they sometimes preempted them. Uh, in fact, many workers liked company unions. That's why they joined them and stayed with them. Uh, they were more cooperative. They weren't uh, organizations with built-in hostility to the employer. Uh, and the, these new unions, particularly the, the CIO unions uh, that flourished after 1935 under this legislation, uh, were, were more than hostile to employers. They, they, they sometimes looked at it as if they were trying to wreck the industries they organized. And uh, they were full of communists. And that's not just a turn of phrase. They were full of actual card-carrying communists. And, in, and indeed, the CIO, uh, e e even the leaders who were not communists, liked having these communists uh, along with them because they worked harder. <laughs> they were more ideologically inspired to get out there and really take risks and, and put in a lot of hours and, and organize workers. And so the CIO unions, uh, whether it's rubber workers or, or automobile workers or, or, or steel workers, uh, all these big industrial unions that organized not along uh, occupational lines, but uh, everybody in a given uh, plant or e even a, a given company or a given industry would belong to the same union. Uh, they, they were full of communists who hated the capitalist system and were viewing this unionization as just a means to the destruction of that system and its replacement with socialism. So, so that was uh, the, not something calculated to bring about industrial peace. And in fact, in 1937, all hell broke loose in labor relations in this country. There were not only big strikes in many of these industries, like uh, the rubber industry and the automobile industry, where CIO unions were attempting to organize, but, but <clears throat> for the first time, the unions began to stage so-called sit-down strikes. Now, this, this, this was really quite an extraordinary thing, because a sit-down strike is not at all what it, what it seems to be from the language. It's not a strike. It, it, it's, a, it, it's a takeover of somebody else's property. These, these men would come into a plant, not work, but not leave, and not let anybody else come in or work there. So they just literally took control of the property. And you might think, well, why didn't the owner call the police and have them eject these people? Well, uh, you're, you're the police in, uh, in, in Detroit. And Ford calls up and says... Uh, I got 12,000 guys sitting here in the plant and they won't leave. What are you going to do? <laughs> there are too goddamn many of them. You can't send the police and eject 12,000 guys who are determined to stay there uh, and willing to use violence against you if you try to throw them out. Uh, so these, these unions and their sit-down strikes and the refusal of state governors and city mayors to, to do what would have been required to bring this action to an end meant that employers just had no choice, but in some cases to capitulate, to recognize these unions, and to enter into collective bargaining agreements with them. And uh, again, think back. This is now part and parcel of what's called the Second New Deal period, 1935 on. The crown jewels being the National uh, Labor Relations Act and the Social Security Act. This is the New Deal's turn to the left. 
It's now starting to repudiate the cartelizers and the big businessmen that it had, had embraced in 1933, uh, if reluctantly. <laughs> it, it, it's not only repudiating them, but it's making them the fall guys. And Roosevelt and his lieutenants are starting to attack them uh, on every occasion, publicly, as uh, as economic royalists, as a people who are wrecking the economy by their selfishness and their, their refusal to do the right thing, like recognize CIO unions, uh, and uh, accusing them of industrial sabotage, saying, why aren't they making investments? They're trying to sabotage my administration. That, that's what they're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is like the saboteur accusing the victim of sabotaging him. Uh, because these businessmen were scared to death. You know, this isn't some nut on a street corner. It's the President of the United States talking this way. They'd never encountered anything like that before. Nothing like that had ever happened before. They hadn't imagined anything like that happening. Bi big businessmen, wealthy people had always been movers and shakers. Now there's some guy in the, in the position of highest power in the government who's threatening to take away their property and who's tolerating occupation of their factories. What's going to happen next? Well, put yourself in their position. They not only are looking at this, but they're looking around the world. Mussolini is taking over the Ita Italian economy, a dictator. Hitler's running the economy, Germany. Okay? A bunch of the smaller countries in, in Europe are gone fascist. Yeah, it looks as if the whole civilized, or what used to be the civilized world, is going to hell in dictatorship. Why should we be different? Especially when our own president is acting as if he wants to be dictator. So they were frightened. And long-term investment was almost non-existent. Okay? The investment that took place in, between 1935 and 1940 was almost all investment in inventories and investment in equipment with short life. Because it made no economic sense in view of the risks associated with appropriating future returns from long-term investment to put good money now into projects that wouldn't pay off fully for 20 or 25 years. So, New construction, new plants, uh, new infrastructure, no. None of those long-term projects, uh, effectively uh, none, uh, were revived in the late 30s. And that's one of the principal reasons why the whole economy never revived. Because if we look at uh, the, the economy's normal operation, it, it has never before or since been the case that it, it, it went 10 years without adding to the capital stock. And that's exactly what it did in the 1930s. Net investment for the entire decade was negative. <laughs> so we, we didn't even make up for depreciation over a 10-year period. Normally, the capital stock would have been growing by 2, 3, 4% a year, and we would have ended up after a decade uh, with a capital stock that that was 20 or 30 percent greater than it had been at the beginning. That's part and parcel of the growth process, adding to our, our capital equipment to accommodate our roundabout production. But it didn't happen in the 1930s because the New Deal scared the devil out of the investor class uh, in the service of FDR selling himself and his policies to the voters. In the face of a situation which is desperate enough for a lot of people, even as late as 1936, still a lot of people hurting. And by that time, a number of complete nutcases were challenging the president from the left. Huey Long, Father Coughlin, Dr. Townsend. People had crazy schemes for having the government give big sums of money to the unemployed or poor or old people. Uh, and those, those schemes had great appeal to the masses. And so Roosevelt looked around and said, you know, I, I, I've got to start sucking those voters away from these guys. 
or I might lose the election. And this demagoguery he, he resorted to so strongly from 1935 on until, until 1940 when he had to start sweet-talking businessmen to get them to cooperate with the war mobilization. <laughs> this demagoguery was responsible for prolonging, I believe, the Depression and would have prolonged it even if the Fed had jacked up the money supply much quicker than it did. Uh, I wrote an article... Uh, making this argument and presenting some evidence that I've never seen anybody else present uh, on the question called Regime Uncertainty. It's in the Independent Review in 1997, if you'd like to look at it. And you may find it useful as a just kind of a synopsis of the Second New Deal, even if you don't like my argument about the Regime Uncertainty. Uh, you can find it online at uh, onpower.org. Well, let me quit now and uh, take your questions or hear your comments. Yeah. I have a question actually about the uh, unemployment data on the uh, slide there. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask whether you thought that there might be uh, certain kinds of unemployment which are actually potentially quite significant that are not listed there. For example, I mean, an argument can be made that conscription shouldn't really be considered a kind of employment because it's actually the government taking resources, right. in which case that drastic recovery there in World War II wouldn't look so drastic if you for that. Wouldn't show up at all. <laughs> Much later on, uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, a lot of uh, drug laws, for example, are putting nonviolent offenders in jail. And if, uh, if I remember my macroeconomics from way back when correctly, um, the government typically doesn't in that include people who are not looking for work. <laughs> and if people are being put in jail for nonviolent crimes, that's artificially suppressing the unemployment rate. Think of it as an unemployment program. <laughs> no, your points are very well taken. Uh, these are standard unemployment data. They, they, they are adjusted in one way at least, to which is that the data for the 1930s have been adjusted so that the, uh, the, the persons on government work relief programs are no longer counted as unemployed. Uh, in the standard uh, Labor Department data series, which is still used by many people, uh, uh, those persons were regarded a as unemployed. And uh, there were anywhere from three to five million of them during the New Deal. So they, they make a substantial difference in the rate of unemployment. You'll see here it never gets above 22%. If you were to throw in uh, those people on the work relief programs, it would be 25% unemployment. And uh, the argument was at the time and since that, that they weren't in regular employment. This was emergency employment. shouldn't be counted as equivalent to real jobs, but uh, I think it's a bad argument, and they should be counted as employed, even though they're, they're employed differently. Uh, they're not unemployed, clearly. Uh, just quickly, what was the logic again why the tenants uh, were being replaced by wage workers? What happened again with that? Well, it, uh, tenants, depending on the kind of tenancy agreement they had, might have a claim to some of these benefit payments going to farmers. Uh, they were supposed to be paid to the farmers. Well, is, is the guy who's renting a farm and operating it, is he the farmer or is the owner the farmer? Well, the owners, of course, wanted to collect the money. And if they had a tenant there uh, who, who might have a uh, claim that would displace his, then his way of dealing with it, uh, in many cases, was to get rid of the tenant and replace him with a form of labor that didn't have a competing claim, such as a wage worker, or replace either one of them with a tractor. How did sharecroppers fa uh, fare during the Great Depression? Uh, they fared badly in general, uh, especially in the South, uh, because uh, many of them were among those displaced by uh, mechanization then or, or by uh, landlord adjustments uh, prompted by the benefit schemes. So they, didn't, they did not do well. Uh, um, you talked about the National Labor Relations Act, the Wagner Act, and... I think when you're talking about the growth in government, you sh should also consider a look at the growth of government-sanctioned unions for government workers. 
When did that all come into effect, and, and how did that all work? Are you familiar with the history? Uh, that didn't come along, along until the post World War II <coughs> era. Uh, in fact, as I recall, it, it dates from around the 1960s sometime. Uh, it used to be the case that government workers were routinely forbidden to strike. And, of course, they didn't like that, uh, or the people who wanted to organize unions of, among government workers didn't like that. And eventually they got the law changed, and, and it's, it's had a big effect because uh, virtually the only growth in unionized labor in recent decades has been uh, government workers. And now uh, the uh, unions have declined so much in the past 50 years that uh, of the private labor force, uh, less than 10% is unionized. But uh, of the government workers, uh, I believe it's something in the neighborhood of 40%. That would is, include teachers. That includes school teachers. And, and of course, they, they're the ones that cause the most trouble because they like to, to wait until school's about to start in the fall and then go on strike and put all the parents in a pinch when they think they're going to get rid of little brats and send them off to the government holding tank so they can go to work or, or do something else with their time. Uh, so pe people are uh, easily <laughs> exposed to extortion by these teachers' unions. They're a big part of the problem. Is there any book or article or anything that, that treats that subject that you're aware of? Uh, Morgan Reynolds has written some very good books uh, that deal with public sector unionism as well as the unionism elsewhere in the economy. Uh, a couple of books written in the 1980s, and they're, they're easy to find. In fact, uh, uh, many of the Mises Institute reading lists uh, uh, list them. So uh, if you don't find them there, just look up Morgan Reynolds on Google and they'll They'll pop right up. Yes, sir. When did the minimum wage legislation go into effect, and, and are there many estimates of what the impact was on the unemployment rate? Well, uh, it went into effect uh, in, in uh, many parts of the economy in 1933, as soon as those codes of fair competition went into effect. And, and that was pretty much about the summer and, and fall of 1933. Uh, now, that didn't cover everybody. Uh, uh, for example, uh, agricultural workers were not uh, covered by a code of fair competition. It was just industry. Uh, domestic workers were not covered and so forth. And uh, then uh, new minimum wage law was passed in 1938, the so-called Fair Labor Standards Act, and it had more coverage and more uniform coverage uh, and, and then that law has been amended a number of times uh, over the years to increase the scope of coverage, and just about everybody's covered nowadays. Uh, and, of course, states have their own minimum wages, and sometimes they set higher rates than the federal rate requires. So, so there's been change over time, and there's some variation across space. There have been many studies of the effect of the minimum wage. It's a, it's a cottage industry in the economics profession, and they, you know, they, they almost all find some, some kind of effect we would expect, that is that they make uh, unemployment greater than it would be otherwise. Uh, occasionally there will be some furor, as there was a few years ago, when somebody pretends to have done a study that shows that effect didn't happen. But uh, uh, those studies are always flawed in some way or another because we, we know from economic theory that if you really have other things equal, you can't increase employment by forcing a higher wage on a labor market. That's just uh, not e good economic logic. Uh, we can always argue about the magnitude of the effect because economic theory doesn't tell us what the magnitude will be. Uh, most of the time it turns out the magnitude that's estimated in these studies is not very big. That is, uh, when the minimum wage is raised, let's say, from $5 to $6, uh, it's often just compensating for some price level changes that have taken place since the last change. So it's not a real change at all. Uh, but, you know, for the moment it's a change. And uh, it has a relatively small effect. A few percentage points change in what the situation would otherwise be for the unemployment rate. Uh, so it's, it's not a big deal because in our economy, 
relatively few people are directly uh, subject to that effect. There aren't that many people in the free market who would earn below the minimum wage that's set. So, so its effect is, uh, is on relatively few people directly. It affects more people indirectly because, uh, indeed, the reason the labor unions support it so actively is not because their members are going to be immediately affected by it, but because many unions have members producing goods which compete with goods produced by people who do own, who do earn around the minimum wage rate. So this is a way of, uh, of uh, placing competitors at a disadvantage, competitors uh, for the, uh, the goods that their members help to produce. Uh, so it's a kind of indirect protectionist scheme for higher wage workers more than anything else, but it's one of those schemes that's easily sold to people as, as what it purports to be, a way to help the poor. Uh, no matter how many times you explain it to people, they, they just refuse to accept the argument. I, I've gone through this any number of times with people myself. We've got a, a guy now in Louisiana in the legislature who's... Uh, who set out to raise the state minimum wage level. And that's all we need in Louisiana, you know, is to reduce the number, you know, the handful of us here are still working and not on welfare down there. Uh, and yet uh, they're, 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 they're trying to do it. And a friend of mine uh, in Baton Rouge, a libertarian over there, he, he's made it a project to persuade this legislator of the error of his ways. And so he's been prevailing upon me for articles to give to this legislator, and I, I, I'm sure this is quite a futile uh, endeavor, but I've, I've done what I could <laughs> to help him out. Yes. just wanted to mention that uh, being, having been a federal employee, uh, a lot of that number is increased or is there because they have what's called a dental plan. And if you join the union, you get this dental right. plan. And most people, the only reason they even join the union is so they can get that so-called freedom. Yeah. I, I think if we looked at the overall level of pay, you know, factoring in the benefit value that is part of the pay packages, we'd, we'd find that government employees, especially at the federal level, are earning substantially above market rates. Uh, uh, the ones at the state and local level are not so far out of line. Uh, in general, although some of them, you know, depending on the work they're doing, uh, are. But uh, there's always been a lot of variation in how much effect unions have in actually changing their wages. Uh, uh, tons of studies have been done in neoclassical labor economics to try to make estimates of this. And they range all the way from nothing, you know, unions that are totally ineffective, to, to some unions, say airline pilots unions, that have you know, maybe even doubled the pay that uh, these workers would be getting without the union. And uh, what you want is to, to work in, uh, if, if you want to make a union really count, then unionize a, a group of workers in an industry where, where there's a, a small amount of labor cost relative to the cost of other inputs, uh, but that labor is very critical. Right? So if you're talking about airlines, there's all this huge capital cost associated with the airplanes and the equipment and the repair facilities and so forth. And then, and then the pilots that come on board, now they're critical. You can't operate your business without pilots to fly the airplanes. But how much uh, of your total cost of operation is pilot expense? Fairly small amount. So that puts them in a position to really squeeze uh, and still not be displaced. Uh, you know, you can't really displace them in the end. Uh, so the, the, those people have been very successful. And uh, if you try to unionize this, uh, somebody like janitors, uh, it has real, really no effect because uh, they just get fired. Or, you know, instead of using a janitor, the cleanup people use a, a mechanical mop or something to clean up the, the building. Yeah, these days when you think about unions, uh, the people that come to mind are these upper um, upper income, like the artist unions and the musician unions and the actors. And 
feels not so much. Okay, we'll call a halt for today.